Well, good evening. We're back at Bon Air First Baptist, and I'm here with Dan Edson and Kenny Rogers, Eric Pacheco moderating once again. We're continuing through chapter 21 of the book of Matthew, and we're starting on verse 33, but to get here, we started uh, the chapter with the triumphal entry, and then the cleansing of the temple, and then just uh, Jesus healing the blind and the lame, and following that, the chief priests and the scribes uh, were angered by it. There's the, the parable of the fig tree following that in this chapter, and then it goes into the chief priests and elders asking by what authority Jesus was doing these things. So the, the tension is building. Jesus returns their question with essentially the same question that they refused to answer. As you said, it would point towards his authority from God. And then he gives the parable of the two sons, which we covered last time. And today's sermon covered the two following parables, the, uh, the parable of the landowner and then the, the marriage feast. So that's kind of the, the framing of this as we get into these parables. And uh, just by way of reminder, the parable of the two sons ended with Jesus saying, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. So not the friendliest exchange so far, and I, I think the theme continues today as it's presented in the book of Matthew. And, and you did allude to the fact that uh, in the other Gospels, it's not framed exactly the same way. Some of the parables are, are spread out a little differently, but, but I think it's, it's to a point, and we'll work that today. Any, anything else you want to do by way of introduction today, Kenny? I, I just think it's interesting. Again, they are, they are ramping, like you said, not the friendliest of exchanges. And by the end of the second parable, uh, they sought to seize him, but they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet, that is, the people. But they are understanding that he's speaking about him, and they want to kill him. They want to destroy him. Sure. And, you know, they've asked him an interesting thing. They've asked him where his authority came from. Sure. But he is, in these parables, and in the parable of the fig tree, the, the action parable, Yeah. he is denouncing their authority and actually putting an end to it. It's, it's a, mm -hmm. quite the turning of the table, so to speak. And really making them declare his, his authority and their lack of authority exactly. in a sense. Exactly. It is quite a turnaround. So let's start with the first, uh, the first of the two parables. And um, it's a parable of the landowner. I won't read through the whole thing in the interest of time, but let's go over the symbolism. So... So first of all, who is the landowner? We're, we're talking about that, uh, the vineyard. Well, I, I will read it then just to, just to kind of set us up and give us all a, a refresher on it. But listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. So first of all, who are we talking about? Who's the landowner? And we can, we can both go over this and then obviously if there's any differing opinions because there, there is some differing opinions. I think you kind of alluded to it from the pulpit today that, that you and your son might be kind of doing a back and forth on, uh, on some of this. Well, we were doing it on the, the, on the symbolism of the fig tree. Sure. I think we would agree on this because if you go back to Isaiah 5, and this is a direct allusion, mm -hmm. uh, let me sing a song from my well-beloved, a song about the vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. There's no doubt that in the Old Testament allusions, and therefore in the New Testament parable, the owner of the vineyard is God. Okay, so the, the landowner, the, the, the owner father. of the vineyard is yeah, God the Father. God the Father. Mm -hmm. And the vineyard then? I think the vineyard is, is the, the, the mission of Israel because what is expected? They're expected to be fruitful. They're expected to, to bear fruit. So the vineyard is not... Well, Dan, and you might have a word on this, but it, it, it is Israel, but it's more than Israel. It's, okay. it's the expectation for Israel, mm -hmm. I, I would think. And I agree with that. I think that Israel is that vineyard that's been planted Okay. Yep. Uh, as, as the people that God chose for the purpose, ultimate, of bringing Jesus into the world. Sure. And, and he expected from them more than what they were giving because they had shifted from his authority to their own. Mm -hmm. That was the essence That's of it. the leaders. Yes. Okay. You're Who's right. in authority here? Right. Mm -hmm. so, so going along with that, who are the vine growers then? 
the vine growers who have shifted the authority towards themselves. I think the vine growers here is obviously the Jewish leadership. The Jewish leadership. So. Yep. Yes. I think so. You, you know, an interesting thing about that allusion to Psalm, too. Let me just read you a uh, just a quick thing from that. Yeah, please. Um, maybe it's in Isaiah. It's Psalm 80, 6 through 16. I knew that. <laughs> If you want to go ahead and talk about something else, you might. <laughs> well, let's talk oh, no, about uh, uh, You cleared it to the mountains. A boar from the forest eats it away, and whatever moves it in the fields feeds on it. You remember who that was written about? No. In the history of the church? You know, Martin Luther. Oh. The, the Catholic Pope accused Luther of being that wild boar <laughs> who's turned loose in the vineyard. Sure did. Well, that didn't cost go. anything, guys. I'm just <laughs> yeah, another free. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> free <me>. No <laughs> charge yet. for that. Good. <laughs> well, back to the uh, the parable. Then the slaves. You, I think, in your in your sermon, you mentioned that they were the prophets. Is yes. That the, the slaves that are being sent to yes. Dan. Same. Yeah. The prophets uh, of God who are coming, trying to get the 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 vine growers back on track and obviously not succeeding. Good way of putting that, back on track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or on track, yeah. Or on track, yeah, exactly, yeah. on mm -hmm. track at all. And then the son, who is the son? The son is Jesus. Jesus. So mm -hmm. it's a picture of Jesus. Yes. And then I guess a follow-up question. You kind of touched on this. So the, he, he often, in this section in general, is talking about the kingdom of God. And then, um, and then we see this. So pre-crucifix, you know, you said Israel and really the mission of Israel. So, so vin the vineyard really is a symbol for the kingdom of God, right? It's a type of, of the kingdom of, or how do you see that? I, I see it that way because it, it, it's, it, he says the kingdom, he, exactly, he says this exactly. Uh, this, is, this vineyard is going to be turned over to other vine growers, mm -hmm. uh, to other tenants. And it's like it's like the kingdom, so I, I think it. I think that's the application. Mm -hmm. The the. What was Israel supposed to manifest? What is the church supposed to manifest? It is supposed to manifest the reign of God. Sure. In the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So it's supposed to glorify God. Yeah. Now Dan might have a different opinion Dan? on that. No, I'm, I agree with that. I think the whole, whether you're talking about Israel as a nation or the church itself, mm -hmm. ultimately for Israel, it, it was to exalt the name of Jehovah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And for the church, it is to exalt the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. We sure. are to live so that Christ is seen in us. Uh, mm -hmm. not, just a, not just words we speak, but how we live our everyday life that overflows, which is why Jesus said, shine your light. So that it can be seen in us. So I, I'm in agreement with, yeah. uh, with with the idea that their goal was to reveal who God was, mm -hmm. and they missed it because they they did just like we do. Just like you look at the sure. seven churches in Revelation, they go through periods where they're okay, and periods where they're not. They're just it's, it's a fact of the human heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So let's go to the end of this. He wraps it up with a question in verse 40. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? Why does he end it with a question? Why does Jesus end it with a question? I think it's part of the rabbinical method, and I, I also think that it, it pulls from them their own self-indictment. Self-indictment? Dan, any thoughts? If he asks you a question, he expects you to answer it. Sure. So what's going to happen? And they should, they should, they should have seen themselves, mm -hmm. but they did not. But they did understand the question with relation to the vineyard and what the owner would do for those unworthy servants. Yeah. Yeah. The light comes on for them after the question. I think so. Yeah, I think you're right. No, after not the question itself. But after verse 42, when Jesus turns that on them, then they realize, wait a minute, he's talking about us. Yeah. And you, even in, in your sermon today, you, you pointed to 2 Samuel 12, where Nathan is rebuking David. Yeah. So 
what, what are the parallels you see between those two, and, uh, and what are some of the differences? You can see there at the end, uh, Nathan ends it with, rather he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him, and then, and then David uh, responds. Then, or, I think the problem that David has, and he's yeah. quickly cured of it, the, the, David's cured and the chief priests are not, right. but the problem is, is self-righteousness. Yeah. That's the problem. Uh, they're, they're just self-righteous. They're filled with themselves. David is filled with himself until Nathan says, Thou art the man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then he's contrite. These men, when Jesus says to them, you're the, you're the man, they're filled with anger and even more hardness. They so sure the, message, the message softens David's heart. The message hardens the Pharisees' heart or the Jewish leaders here. Yeah. Well, that, that goes back to what we looked at a few weeks ago when we were talking about why Jesus speaks in parables. They had already rejected the truth. He had worked out of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, beginning in Matthew 8, going through Matthew 12. He had done a m number of miracles, and they said, show us a sign. Exactly. They had the signs, but they had rejected them. Mm -hmm. When you come to this portion of Scripture, then they're wanting to know what is your authority. So he reverts back to John the Baptist sure. because he knew, and, and, and uh, Warren Wiersbe says this in his writings on this, they understood what John the Baptist was saying, but they rejected it. And so it is this continual downhill slide, and I don't remember who said it years ago, if God speaks to you and you reject it, you move further into darkness. Mm. And that's what they were doing. They were consistently moving into darkness because they rejected what God was revealing to them. John the Baptist was a part of that, but the miracles and the message of Jesus was the greater part of it. And mm -hmm. so they consistently moved toward darkness mm -hmm. so that when they get here, they're saying, by what authority? Mm -hmm. So they, they, they consistently rejected, and that's why he continues in parables. Sure. Yeah, the Word of God certainly seems to either soften the heart or harden the heart, but it doesn't leave it unchanged. It does not, and it depends on your response to it. If God speaks and you do not obey, uh, I had a pastor friend years ago that said, if God speaks to your heart and you do not obey, God will not speak again until you first obey what He first spoke. Uh, why would He tell you to do something else if you're not going to do what He did in the first place? Mm -hmm or what he said in the first place. That's their situation here. They consistently move themselves into darkness. And the only way to deal with darkness is to try to deal with the light and they wanted to kill it. Mm -hmm. Yes, they certainly do. And we're about to get to that. Before we do so, let's, let's talk about uh, verse 42 there, where Jesus says to them, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it's, it is marvelous in our eyes. So what's, what are we talking about here? What is the stone? The stone is Jesus. The stone is, is Jesus. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, and everybody understands that he means himself. Mm -hmm. And what has happened here is that the builders, as, as you prayed this morning, the builders have rejected the stone, and the stone is over them. Sure. And so then the stone accepts those who do not reject him, but, you know, they're... Mm -hmm. They're certainly not deserving. No one is deserving. Mm. And, you know, I would, just going back to what Brother Dan was saying a moment ago, I would go with that to, to this point. I sure. think that, that darkness loves darkness because it is darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, but but at, at some point for there to be light, there has to be, it's like a, a blind person. There's light, but they can't respond to it because they don't have the right, Mm. receptacle sure in order to have the right sure. receptacle you have to have the holy spirit mm -hmm. kind and, of the uh, image of paul before the image of paul before this is absolutely right and then uh, i think the 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 action parable in paul's life is the fact that he is blinded mm. initially and uh and ananias comes and prays for him and the the blinders the, the something like scales he says mm -hmm. fall off, falls off his eyes i think that is a physical symbol of what has happened to him spiritually and these men they are in darkness and they get if there's a, a such thing brother dan they're going 
from darkness into deeper darkness into deeper darkness into, into you know, the Old Testament in order to emphasize things uses pairs of words or sometimes like in the holy, 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 or again. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there was this, in, I can't remember what, it's in the Pentateuch, but they talked about the, the pit pits. Mm. So to describe how, how deep they were, mm. these were, these were not just pits, these were pit pits. We, we talked about this morning, Dan. Hmm. So they, they are in pits. dark darkness, darker darkness, hmm. eventually darkest darkness. Mm -hmm. and, and that darkness that they're moving into reveals their very character. Exactly. Jesus said in John 3, they love darkness rather than light right. because their deeds are evil. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's who they are. In order to maintain your position, you have to move away from Christ. Mm -hmm. And mm. that's what they were doing, moving into greater darkness. Mm. Mm. So let's, let's look at the verse 34. I say to you, the kingdom of, uh, well, actually, let me specifically to verse 44. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whom it ever, whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. So what's a practical example of falling on this stone and being broken to pieces? The chief priests and the Pharisees trying to kill Jesus, and then in the end, everything they've worked for to try to uphold their power, their authority, let's, let's just say that's in, in symbolized or realized in the temple itself mm. in AD 70, that's going to be destroyed. Yes. Dan, any thoughts? Uh, from, a, from a Jewish perspective, that is right. When you come to modern day thinking, yeah. to fall upon him and be broken is our laying down our lives, mm. where we, we fall on him, what we discover. And, and God just, 32 or three years ago, I encountered that verse and God spoke to my heart from it and I backed away from it. Mm. To fall on him and be broken means I have nothing. Mm. I have discovered since then to fall on him and be broken opens the door. And this is the way that God expressed it to me. He only fills broken vessels. Mm -hmm. Because when you break, and God uses our struggles and our difficulties to do that, when you are broken, you are poured out so that he can fill you. And so he's talking here to them about who he is and his authority in life. You fall on me and are broken, but if I fall on you, you're ground to powder. Mm. Because when you, when you go back to Matthew 5, where we started looking at, at the teachings of Jesus, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm. And that poverty that he is talking about is the nothingness that he brings us to in our journey with him so that he becomes everything. We are, and mm -hmm. one of the expressions of that is in Genesis 3, what I call the poverty of nakedness, mm. where we realize we have absolutely nothing to offer him. Sure. Nothing. So we fall on him and are broken, and in that brokenness, all of self dies out and he fills us. It's not, a, it's not just a one-time event. It's something he brings us to over and over and over in our lives. What he was saying to them was, you fall upon this stone, Okay, so you're, you're, you're taking it to more than the kind of the image of a baptism where you're buried with Christ and you're brought into a new life. You're yes. taking it to more of a, a renewing, uh, so how would you say that? More of a, like an empowerment of the Spirit or, or like what are you... Uh... Well, it's like Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Sure. But Christ liveth in me. God, day by day, walks us through this brokenness process so that Christ becomes everything, which is what Paul said in mm. Philippians 2. So or to kind me, of the, to the live walk of, a, of, a, of sanctification, yes. this side of glory. Yep. And so when he's talking to the Jewish leaders, what were they doing? They were the ones who were going to crush the rock mm. rather than fall upon it and be broken because that would have diminished their place of authority mm. and, and shifted the authority to him, which is what they should have done. Well... Either way, it's what they did, right? Well, they did. They <laughs> yeah. just they didn't do it sure. from the they no, didn't do they it didn't from the daylight they section. It. They did it from the dark absolutely. section. They did. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So more from the practical perspective that you were mentioning 
previous, and you mentioned it in your sermon, you talked about the, the various kingdoms that uh, you were thinking about. Well, that was really more on the wedding feast, wasn't right. it? Right, yeah, that's but, where, uh, they, where he burns their city. It, it, it is interesting to think that, that they were expecting Jesus to come in and to defeat Rome, mm -hmm. but instead, if you pan ahead 900 years, the Holy Roman Empire is a world power and Israel no longer exists as a nation. It's exactly. I, and I, I, would, uh, I would say to what Dan is saying, that's true, but I think, I think this goes in one of two directions. Sure. Because the same, the same rain and sun that hardens one soil mm -hmm. softens another. Yeah. Right. So in, in what he's saying, you, you, the message falls upon you, the message breaks you, and, and the message then rebuilds you. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly see that, sure. no, no doubt about it. But I also think in context here, again, to make another modern application, that would be for those who, who defy Jesus and reject Jesus, eventually they will be broken to pieces and they will be scattered like dust. Mm -hmm. there, there is the judgment aspect of this. So, so this can go in, in, in the direction that he's saying, and it can go in the direction of judgment. Sure. And, and really, I mean, after salvation, it has to go in the direction of sanctification. Yes, to, absolutely. In a, in a spiritual practice. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with that. Well, let's go to verses 45 and 46 here. The, the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the parables. They understood that he was speaking about them. And then, of course, their response is, they sought to seize him. Um, so how, how do we wrap our minds around the fact that he's demonstrated his, his authority repeatedly? He's actually prophesying the fact that they're going to try to kill him and, in fact, prophesying that they will kill him. And then their plan is, let's kill him. Yeah. How, that doesn't see, to me, that, that's the time to call knock it off on that plan, but it seems like they're still, uh, <laughs> still going with it. How do, how do we figure that one out? I, I think it goes back to what Dan said a moment ago. These guys, their father is, is the devil. Jesus has already said this. And so even as he is defeated but will never admit his defeat, mm -hmm. they're the same way. Yeah. They're defeated, and, and every time they go against him, it's like, it's like in Perry Mason with Warren Berger. Yeah, you say like, I believe I'm going to let some other guy take one for the team this time because yeah. Perry's going to beat my brains out, you know. Mm. But he always takes it himself, and he always gets beaten, but he never quits. Mm. And I think these guys are like that; they never quit. They just never learn. Yeah, because they're in darkness. Mm -hmm. and, and and once you start that journey, you continue it. Because they're, all, they're already dark, and so for as far back as we looked in Matthew's gospel, you see this pattern all along the way. Show me a miracle. Tell me your authority. They are setting him up mm -hmm. so that they can just reject him, and what winds up happening is that they find themselves further into darkness. And, sure. and what Brother Kenny said was right. says they move that way because that's where they are. Mm-hmm. And so when you come to these verses talking about them wanting to kill him, yeah. there again, if the voice doesn't support you, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What they didn't understand was yeah. that when they killed him, they were fulfilling God's plan. Yeah. Here's your great reference. What's that? He tasks me. He tasks me. Yeah. You know where that's from? You've told me before. But okay. <laughs> the last time was the movie The Wrath of Khan. <laughs> but originally, it's from the novel Moby Dick. Oh, okay. The White Whale. Captain Ahab says, he tasks me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's... And the White Whale represents Christ in that mm -hmm. fitting. Yeah. Yeah. He tasks them. He tasks them so. Let's, let's move on to the marriage feast now and, and the symbolism involved in this one. Who, again, who's the king in this, in this scenario? The king, is, God the, the king is God the Father. And then, and then the son is, is still a symbol of, yep. of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the slaves, still kind of the prophets. prophets. Mm -hmm. And then who are those that are originally invited? I think it's Israel. I think I do. Yeah. Okay. Israel in agreement. And then who, uh, it, it says, you know, they ignored the invitation. So it's, uh, it's the, same, the same people. So, and then the ones from the highways. I think in the immediate context, it is the, the less desirables of Israel. 
Mm -hmm. Going back to chapter 21 to verse uh, 31. Okay. Uh, truly, yeah. I say the tax collectors and prostitutes. Yeah. But I think, in, is it telescopes out? I think it's the, the Gentiles mm -hmm. as well. Uh, yeah. I, I think certainly that includes the Gentiles. So everyone that wasn't originally invited. Yes. Yeah. Dan? Yep. Yeah. And then, so let, let's just make, before we talk about the, the wedding clothes and, and specific to that, what's the difference between the ones who ignore the invitation and the ones who show up or the one who shows up unprepared? Um, do you see any, any parallel between this and the parable of the, of the seeds and the sower? I do. I, I, I'm, that's an interesting way of asking the question. Because obviously the, the ones who respond now represent those who have been listening and, and in the crowds themselves. Let's think about the crowds themselves. The crowds who, who think Jesus is a prophet, they're going to be played by the Pharisees mm -hmm. and the chief priests. They're going to be played to the point where they're going to turn on Jesus, many of them. Yeah. So I think that the many are called, the few are chosen. I think it does represent that there are the, the true believers who come from the various peoples of the earth and even the peoples of Israel who receive Christ. And then there are those who aren't, uh, who aren't serious, who don't honor the king. I think the difference is, though, is that the, the leaders of Israel openly and intentionally reject Jesus the, the man who comes and responds to the invitation, I think that he pays lip service to Jesus, but yeah. doesn't receive Jesus in his heart. Okay. Kind of like the son that said he would, but he didn't in the previous parables. Or the first, no? Yeah, yeah only the son who said he would and didn't is Jewish leadership. Okay. And so, I, you know, I didn't say this in the morning service, and, and, and you're reading, Dan, you might have come across this, but there's some commentators, and MacArthur is one of them, who believes that the king actually did provide the wedding clothes. Okay. And, and that yep. is a possibility. Sure. Yeah. So if he provided the wedding clothes and this man comes and he doesn't take the king's wedding clothes, yeah. then he's saying, I want to come to the feast, but I want to come in my own okay. righteousness. Right. I want to sure. come in my We've own adornment. Yeah. And so the king says, you don't come to my feast unless you're in, in my wedding clothes. Okay. I, and yeah. I read that too. I don't remember who I was reading. Mm -hmm. It said that the king provided the clothes and this one person did not receive them because of his own sense of self-worth or right. self-sufficiency perhaps is mm -hmm. a term. Yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah, let me read out of Isaiah 61. Um, verse, starting at verse 10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, as the garden causes the things to grow in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. That was one of the references that I'd seen or heard of in, in reference to this. And then I think in Galatians, I had another one. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. And so, I mean, the, the, the visualization of being clothed in Christ and being clothed in righteousness by God is, is and, and I think that applies either way, whether, whether the king provided the clothes or whether the, it's just a simple a matter of the man not respecting the king by by wearing the proper attire, being clean, and, and uh, that kind of thing, uh, at the end of the day, the, the man is a hypocrite. Sure. That's, that's, that's the problem. Um, well, one thing, if we could go back, if you had to, did you have, go ahead. I just want to go back to this, and yeah. I don't know if you, this is a question. If it is, I'll, mm. I'll defer the question. But, but in, in Matthew's parable of the marriage feast, he does point out that the king is enraged because the people, this is in verse 7, uh, rejected his invitation, seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. I do see in this a progressive judgment upon Israel through Assyria on the northern kingdom, uh, Babylon on the southern kingdom, and Rome ultimately on the people who were there rejecting Jesus. Yeah, so a, a kind of a practical... Yeah. application to almost a, a prophetic uh, yeah, all, yeah. yeah 
it's prophetic in the sense of Rome, but it, then it's retrospective in the sense of... of Assyri- you're right, yeah, retrospective the and prophetic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that was a pattern that God developed in the Old Testament. He used other nations to bring judgment on he did. them. Sure. And so it would fit that he would be thinking that same thing, not judgment in the sense that he just caused fire to fall out of heaven. He could have done that, but he used other nations because of their role among the nations. If you go back to the book of Exodus... One of the things God said to him is, I want you to bear this message, specifically the Ten Commandments. I want you to bear it to the other nations. And they did not. And there was this constant up and down and up and down. Mm -hmm. You see it in the northern kingdom consistently, but you see it in the southern kingdom with the up and down. So using that, but you were talking about being dressed in clothing. Second Corinthians 5.21, Paul talks about being dressed in the righteousness of Christ. Sure. So he dresses us. Now, when you're dealing with a physical reality and a spiritual reality, the physical reality can, can be limited. Right. Sure. Uh, that's the whole issue of parables. There's, sure. there's limits within it. But we have to be dressed in the righteousness of Christ yeah. to enter the presence, and that's our position in Christ right. is exactly. what, you, what you were saying. Yep. Exactly yep. right. Yep. So why are these three parables, including the one from last week's sermon, why are they grouped together following the, the, the barren fig tree? I, th- I think because it answers the question of authority. It ties in with the ministry of John the Baptist. It, if, if they accepted John the Baptist, which they did not, then they have to accept that Jesus is the Messiah of, of God, which they do not. And then Jesus turning the tables on them. And I think these three parables turn the tables on them and and in, in, in the action parable of the fig tree to show that their authority is being taken away from them and they're being judged. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a statement here from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. Sure. This series of three parables grew out of the demand of the chief priests and elders for Jesus to explain what authority he had for cleansing the temple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were consistently looking for authority. hmm he just did, and what did you, he gave them the authority from the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did. And they did not, they did not go back to that. Yeah. You, you look at this, the authority keeps being, he's the son. Mm-hmm. The, the son, he's the son who comes in the parable of the, of the vineyard. Yeah. He's the son who was in the, in the wedding feast. Yeah. He's the son. And you mentioned in the other gospels, he's mentioned as the beloved son. And the beloved mm-hmm. son. That's right. Would, and uh, tie back to his baptism. So his authority yeah. is... And this is veiled, I think, to the to the chief priests and the Pharisees. But his authority is he's the Son of God. Sure. Because the illusion, going back to the Old Testament, is is that Israel is the vineyard. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Israel is the bride of God. Yeah. You see that in Hosea. Sure. And Israel has failed mm-hmm. miserably. Yeah. I think it's real easy to look at this. We're used to reading the New Testament from a perspective of expecting the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders to not follow Jesus and to, to fall on the wrong side of, of the law, or not the law, but the new covenant. But I, I think this would be a lot more exciting or, or, or worrisome or, or at least intense for the, for the contemporary Jew of the time where their whole ecclesiastic structure is, is being pointed to as a barren fig tree, as, exactly. as a son that it, it, said he would, but he wouldn't, as, you know, all these things. Yeah, it's exa- and that's why they're so upset. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think they see that. And he, not only through a new covenant perspective, but they have failed from the old covenant yes, perspective. Yeah. It's like sure. what you said a while ago. Their mission was to be a light to the nations, mm-hmm. that's right. a witness to the nations. They failed. Mm. You look at the temple. What are they doing in the temple? They're keeping the people away. Yeah, they're creating barriers. That's mm-hmm. right. Well, you, again, you go back to the to uh, Matthew five, six, and seven when Jesus is teaching. He is bringing them up to the place where, where the law is no longer a letter; it is a spirit, mm-hmm. and they have missed it. They have. They're trying to live by the letter of the mm-hmm. law, and and the letter of the law just hardens the heart. Which is yep. why when you get to where we are in Matthew 21 and 22, they're totally rejecting his authority. Mm. Yep, that's good. So gentlemen, we're running out of time. Did anything stand out to you for the first time or in a different way as you read through this section? Just the whole idea of authority and how Jesus is bringing their, they're trying to bring his authority in question, but really what he's doing authority. is he's 
bring their authority. And we've question. been on the topic of authority ever since the Sermon on the Mount. Exactly. Uh -huh. We have. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Well, I think one yeah. thing, and, and again, I read this and don't remember where I read it. I'm 74. Y'all can forgive that. Mm. But somebody said that. Um, I can appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't need to just read the Bible. We need to ask God to use the Bible to read us. Yeah. Mm. The issue here isn't about those Jewish leaders. What about me? Mm. Am I like one of them? Sure. Do I question his authority mm -hmm. in my life? When he says, this is what I want, do I say, wait a minute, do I, I need to analyze this? Or, mm -hmm. you see, because the intent of Scripture is not just to give us historical reality, it's to give us present tense reality. And that's what I saw in this as we were, as I was studying, getting ready for this afternoon and listening to Kenny this morning. I had to come back to the statement that was made. I need to let it read me. Mm and see where my heart is. Mm -hmm. Because if my heart is not right, I'm no different from the Pharisees. Sure. And at the very minimum, we've all at some point in our life rejected the one who could have rejected us, That's but exactly instead right. redeemed us. That's yeah. right. Well put. Well, Kenny, are we going to finish uh, chapter 22 next week? How far are we going to get? That is the plan. Because uh, <laughs> the, there's two questions. The question of the tribute to Caesar and then Jesus answers the Sadducees. The chapter that is going to be the one that's going to be tough to divide is going to be 23. It'll have to be divided into half, and I know Bo will be glad to hear that. It gives him an extra week before he gets to 24. Uh, so we're probably three weeks into 22 and 23. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. As always, it's a pleasure. I appreciate you taking the thank time you. to help me work through this, and I'm sure they appreciate Likewise. it to get to watch this at home. If you wouldn't mind closing us with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had together this afternoon to go deep into your word and to look at these issues that were raised this morning in the message, Lord, to better understand. And I just pray that we would be, as Brother Dan has said tonight, that your word would always read us, that when we look into your word, that it would be a mirror to our hearts and our minds and our lives, that we might conform ourselves by the working of the Holy Spirit, by our obedience to the Holy Spirit, that we might be conformed to your truths. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.